Hello. We are going to show you uh, the slideshow for the uh, session eight data translation sessions. Um, as usual, actually, let me see here. I'm going to try to run this in presentation mode. And uh, see how that works. Um, I normally show these slides in uh, file mode rather than in uh, presentation mode, but I'm going to show at least part of the at least the beginnings uh, in in presentation mode uh, to show a little a little uh, video gimmick that I have here, and then I'll switch back to uh, file file mode. Okay, so this is the uh, February 24, 2015 edition of our DITA class, uh, DITA translations session eight. Um, this session, uh, uh, these slides outline the concepts covered in the eighth session of the data translation uh, session. Some of these slides may be repeats from earlier um, uh, presentations. And uh, again, this is an online session. Okay. So the uh, work that we have this week uh, is uh, the uh, data translation. Specifically, we will talk. We will be talking about translating data best practices, uh, and within those best practices, we'll talk about XLIF, um, translation memory, and TMX, and term base or glossaries and TBX. For today, I've asked you to do some reading of some uh, online materials. Uh, the uh, data uh, to translate um, using. Uh, the best practices uh, article here uh, using XLIF to translate data projects uh, at that URL is one that I hope you have read. Uh, I've asked you to read the XLIF specification sections four and five. So that's the core uh, features and the modules. And that's at that URL there. And I've asked you to read um, uh, reuse uh, translations with TMX uh, TM and TMX at this URL, and I asked you to read Introduction to Term Base uh, Exchange TBX at uh, this URL here. Okay, uh, and then a reminder: next week, uh, next week will be the last in-class session that we hold for this term. Uh, my plan is to come prepared to answer any questions that you have. So think about uh, what you are um, maybe need some help with. Uh, regarding what uh, might show up on the final exam, uh, what you may ha need help with regarding uh, what's going to happen on the, um, uh, what you have left to do with the, uh, the projects. And uh, if you need me to answer questions, demonstrate anything, I'll come with a few demonstrations already prepared, uh, but this session will be for you, and it's really for you to uh, uh, ask me for any help that you might have. Okay, starting off uh, uh, today, we have uh, some terms that will be uh, important for our data translation, our, your understanding of data translations. And I might use uh, some or all of these terms uh, within this presentation, so I want to kind of uh, give you an idea of what they, what they mean. You might hear me say LSP, that stands for Localization Service Provider, and that's a company providing translation and localization services. Uh, SRX. Uh, segmentation Rules Exchange. That's an XML open standard defining how to segment text uh, for translation and other language related processes. TBX, Term Base Exchange. Uh, that's an XML open standard for representing um, and exchanging terminologi terminological data. Uh, TM, that's Translation Memory. That's a big one. Uh, a collection of segments which can be uh, sentences, paragraphs, or text strings that have been previously translated in order to aid human translators. I'll go over exactly what that means in a little bit here. TMX, Translation Memory Exchange, uh, an XML open standard defining the exchange of translation memory uh, b data between computer-aided translation and localization tools like XLIF. Uh, and then there's XLIF, uh, the XML Localization Interchange File Format. 
That's an XML open standard defining a lossless interchange format for translating text. Okay, so those are uh, what those terms mean uh, and what the acronyms stand for. And then uh, as we get into each of these sections, I'll, I'll explain a little bit more. Starting off with XLIF. So here's the thing. Translating can be difficult or translating can be easy. Uh, and that's due to the paradox. Uh, the paradox is that DITA's strength is its ability to harness many topics for a variety of outputs. That's one of the things that we like DITA for. But paradoxically, uh, uh, DITA's difficulty for localization service provider providers is its many files. It's difficult to uh, for a localization service provider to manage uh, uh, you know hundreds, thousands, millions of, of files, and I'll I'll get more into that as we as we go on. Okay, so starting with the translating can be difficult leg of that last statement. Um, here's a, a somewhat common scenario: the uh, uh, somebody comes up with this great idea. Hey, boss, let's switch to DITA. Uh, it's a con component content management system. It's a great idea. What do you think? And the boss is kind of indifferent about it. And then the person trying to, to uh, uh, make this case says, it's nimble. Uh, and the boss is not so impressed. Uh, it's um, no more document-centric constraint. And the boss really doesn't know what the person's talking about. Uh, it's supported by tools and best practices. And the boss is distracted looking at other things. Uh, it's more precise information for our customers. And finally, the boss says, show me the money. And the person thinks about it and says, we can save boatloads of money and time uh, on translations. And the boss says, uh, sold. That, that sounds great. Let's do this. And then nine months later, when we uh, go to do the calculations, we find that uh, the savings just aren't there. Uh, and that's, um, that's a pitfall that uh, people can fall into. And I'll explain why that happens and then how we can avoid that. Uh, so the problem is that um, one of the problems is that uh, with uh, data projects are typically lots and lots of files, and they're tedious to, to process one by one. Data projects can consist of hundreds, thousands, or even millions of topics. Uh, localization service providers can process data topics, but it's not their core competency, right? Their core competency is translating. So uh, they rightfully charge extra for the overhead and the expertise, and that overhead can be significant. So let's consider this uh, example. We have a, a source uh, a file that we want to have translated. It's our 36-page data sheet. Uh, that data sheet uh, consists of 32 data maps, 283 data topics, and 46 images available as SVG or PNG. So that's a lot of files. So um, let's show the translation workflow without XLIF. And I will say that this is what I would characterize as the ill-advised workflow, right? This is just throwing the topics over the wall to the translators. Okay, so um, we start off with the data repository with 350 files. Uh, we find a way to export all of those 350 files, and we throw them over the wall to our localization service provider. The localization service provider says, sure, no problem, I'll take your money, or I mean, I'll, I'll take the job. Uh, and we notice that it's, uh, uh, in this particular case, uh, January of 2014 when the project starts. So um, the uh, localization service provider takes those files and they, they put it into their black box and we don't know what happens. Uh, and eventually, out the other end comes all of the translated files. They hand them back to uh, the person requesting the translation but in the uh, final analysis, we've wasted many, many cycles in time. We've spent lots and lots of money, and um, we haven't uh, um, achieved the kinds of savings that we want. So um, the problem is that uh, in that workflow, this is the ill-advised workflow, uh, in the, uh, the blue area in the box on the left, that's the domain of the content owner or the data shop. Um, the, the yellow area on the right is the domain of the LSP. These are all the steps we're asking the uh, LSP to do in this particular workflow. So if we start off with step one on the left-hand side, upper left-hand side, we have a collection of data topics and SVG files in our component content management system. The files are gathered, uh, exported, and provided to the localization service provider in step two there. Then starting with step three, all the uh, this is all in the domain of the localization service provider. and 
uh, they rightfully, you know, turn their meter on, if you think of the metaphor of the taxi cab, and begin to charge us for all of these things that they're doing. And it's, uh, you know, and time starts to tick also. So we're, we're adding money, uh, we're adding time. Uh, step three, all of the files are tested by the localization service provider. Step four, the localization provider may transform all of those data topics to XLIF themselves, or they may not. Um, if they do uh, uh, transform it to XLIF, then they go to step 5A, which is to open the XLIF file in their computer-aided translation uh, tool. Or in step, uh, if they don't transform the uh, data topics to XLIF, they go to step 5B, which is to open each of those data files in their computer-aided translation tool. Either way, they then move to step 6, where they leverage the translation memory. Uh, step 7, they finally do the translations. And then in step 8, if they've done step 4, they will do step 8, which is to transform the XLIF back to the source file format. Uh, step 9 is that the translation is in context reviewed. And then back over to the domain of the content owner. Uh, after the localization service provider has done all of those things, um, then uh, you know we may or may not have a, a quality uh, uh, data returned to us. In step 10, the translated uh, content is approved. In step 11, we have this uh, all of the translated uh, data and SVG files in our component content management system. So if you send uh, all of these 350 files to the localization service provider, they will charge uh, file management fees for all 350 files. They will open each file and test for corruption. As I said, in the best case, they will have automated tools at their place, and they'll be able to um, uh, uh, do all of the things that we care about that we're paying them to do uh, uh, to, to those topics, which would be to leverage the translation memory uh, to edit the, uh, each of those topics in their computer-aided translation tool uh, to review all of those topics and then to convert all of those topics back to data. So that's best case scenario. Worst case scenario is that they will have to leverage the translation memory and translate each of these 350 files one at a time. So this cute little automation, uh, this cute little uh, animation that I have here is just showing uh, what does it look like to actually have to interact even for a split second with 350 files and that was a lot of processing just to get those files to uh, pop up on the screen. Imagine 350 files, and this is a relatively small data sheet uh, to be transformed by the localization service provider uh, in terms of uh, uh, one by one. So th there is a better way. So now I'm going to change out of uh, presentation mode. I'm not sure how this video is going to, going to work, but uh, let's just go ahead and uh, get out of that. That was my reason for showing it in, in um, in uh, that mode because I thought it was kind of a clever uh, animation. So uh, as usual, now I'm switching back just into the file uh, mode so that I can bring other screens in. So the risks are um, that it, uh, there would be extra expense, it would take extra time, uh, there would be a potential damage uh, or, or uh, hit to the quality you know, in, in handling all of those um, 350 files. We might have inconsistent translations because we're doing them one at a time. Uh, we might have conversion misfires at the localization service provider level. And then we might suffer from vendor lock-in. That means, um, you know, the, the, uh, the localization service provider might figure out ways to deal with our workflow. Uh, but, you know, because they've taken the time to do that and they know how to do that, we're kind of locked into them as our translator. And at the end of the day, uh, we have uh, unhappy results, wasted time, wasted money, and bad quality, potentially. So let's contrast that with the uh, uh, workflow that does include XLIF, and this is the best practice. Okay, I would characterize this as uh, the advised way to go. So now we're talking about um, uh, translating can be difficult or translating can be easy. I don't necessarily think I would call it easy, but I would call it better. And once you have the automation in place, then it becomes pretty turnkey. But I guess you would never say that translation is what you would call easy. 
Um, so the strategy is to take the uh, advantage of the data uh, map file in order to manage the uh, uh, creation uh, or to manage many topic files and then create a, an XSLT or some kind of automation that reads the map file and then converts each of the referenced files into a single XLIF file. So the way that would look, uh, going back to our cartoon metaphor, uh, if we have our data repository, we have some kind of a mechanism, an automated mechanism that rather than exporting all of those XLIF files, it does the transformation and creates a single XLIF file. The XLIF file is uh, handed off to the localization service provider and uh, they should be able to process that, ju process that just fine. So uh, they're able to open it uh, uh, natively with their computer-aided translation tools because their tools open XLIF uh, uh, as uh, the file format of choice. Uh, they would leverage the translation memory. They would follow the best practices. And then they would uh, return to us the um, translated XLIF file. And uh, since it was fast, um, accurate, and uh, the, the cost of overhead was managed, we are, in that last frame, very pleased with the result. Okay, so let's take a look at that workflow in our, our, uh, our block diagram. Uh, again, the, uh, the part in blue is the domain of the uh, content owner or the data shop, and the, dom the uh, domain in yellow is uh, what we're asking our localization service provider to do. And as you'll see, this, this keeps uh, them doing exactly what their core competency is, and that's to do the translation. So step one, we have our collection of data and SVG files in our component content management system. Step two, uh, the files are gathered and verified by the component content management system. Step three, uh, we automate uh, in the content management system the transformation uh, to XLIF. Step four, we uh, hand the XLIF file over to our localization service provider, which they should be delighted to get because their tools will open it natively. So then we cross over into the domain of the localization service provider in step five, and they open it in their computer-aided translation tool. They leverage translation memory. They translate in step seven the uh, uh, XLIF with their computer-aided translation tool. In step eight, they return the files to us, and then we're back into the domain of the content owner, the owner of the data files. Uh, the content management system automatically transforms those back to data. Uh, the translation is completed and approved in step 10, and in step 11, we have a collection of translated data topics and SVG in uh, our component content management system. So um, doing th this way, uh, we've mitigated a lot of those, those risks, right? So they will not charge us for the uh, file management fees of all of those files. Uh, they will open just one XLIF file. Uh, Computer-aided translation tools like XLIF. XLIF is the native file format for the computer-aided translation tools. The localization service provider can then perform the translation workflow steps that we care about on the XLIF file, right? They will leverage the translation management. They will edit and translate the XLIF in their computer-aided translation tool. Uh, they will do the review, and then they will uh, give us the um, XLIF. Uh, and we will not be asking them to convert the XLIF back to data because our automatic tools will take care of that. So the risks are mitigated. We have lower expense. We've saved time. Quality is better. Uh, we have consistent translations. Uh, there's no risk of a file conversion misfire, and we are not locked into a single vendor. So at the heart of all this, as I've mentioned many times, is XLIF. So XLIF stands for the XML Localization Interchange File Format, and it is the OASIS open standard for the exchange of localization and translation content. Uh, translation tools use XLIF as their native file format. Translators know and like XLIF. Um, XLIF 1.2 was passed in 2008 with a schema and a specification. And then just recently, in August of 2014, uh, we just passed XLIF 2.0, which is a very good uh, standard. Uh, Truth in Advertising, I am the chair of the XLIF Technical Committee. Okay. Um, the DITA Adoption TC has taken notice, and uh, they have uh, the translation subcommittee. Uh, the DITA Adoption TC is at this URL, 
and within the data adoption TC there's a feature article called using XLIF to translate data projects it's at this URL that was part of your assigned reading for today and uh, hopefully you've read that and understand why the data adoption TC notes uh, XLIF as being the best practice for translating uh, data okay so the way that translation workflow works is that we start off in the upper left hand corner with our source language XML files, uh, data files, and uh, all of the linked graphics within those uh, data files, which best case would be SVG. We transform the whole thing into XLIF. We have a single XLIF file. The localization service provider translates that file. We then have a translated XLIF file uh, along with uh, uh, that it contains all of the information for the, uh, the, the data and the uh, SVG we transform that back into its initial format and we have in our repository a translated version of all of the data files and the SVG images. Okay, so this, what I've just described is the classic uh, extract and merge paradigm. So uh, to put it in even simpler terms, we start off with our source data, we extract the localizable text and format information into a single XLIF file uh, the localization service provider opens this with their uh, translation tools. They translate, translate the XLIF file. It now becomes a bilingual XLIF file, which we convert back into our initial format, in this case, DITA, and we have the translated project. So uh, the translation model is very, very simple in XLIF. We isolate the translated text into translation units or units, uh, which are segmented and then uh, the source content is in the source element and the place where we expect the translator to do their transformation or the, excuse me their translation is in the target element very simple and then we re retain the uh, the source documents structure okay okay so how do we do that um, we there are lots of ways to do that one way f for sure uh, is to use the data xlif round trip tool this is the tool that i wrote and i i made a separate video which is at this url uh, hopefully you've had a chance to look at this video to see the uh, how the xlif round trip tool the data xlif round trip tool works uh, but basically it goes through these steps so uh, you install the uh, two directories that come with that plugin into the plugins directory so that's data from XLIF version 2 and XLIF version 2. Uh, so in that uh, installation, I provide, uh, oh yeah, I should say that this, this open toolkit is um, written and, and maintained by me. And uh, so I, I'll refer to it in first person quite a bit in this uh, presentation. Uh, so then you will notice that uh, in the, um, uh, uh, plugins directory in the samples directory I have uh, a number of sample uh, data files the one that um, we will refer to in this presentation and that is part of your uh, uh, deliverable assignment is the guitars sample so it comes with a bunch of concepts DTDs images and tasks and uh, a data map that kind of ties them all together uh, and then you can see that it makes this kind of output so uh, we need to launch our um, our data open toolkit environment. We've talked about how to do that several times. If you're on, on Windows, you just double click the start command dot bat file. If you're in uh, on the Mac, you type sh space startcmd dot sh, and it will uh, take you into your data open toolkit uh, enabled directory. So in this case, you uh, uh, change directory to the xlif v2 directory in the plugins um, you would then type ant minus f space build underscore data to xlif dot xml and uh, uh, as uh, um, uh, time goes by uh, you will eventually see the uh, the affirmative uh, build successful message which is a good thing uh, then you would go to the uh, sample directory or, um, uh, the which uh, will create an, an XLIF 2.0 version of that guitars uh, uh, data um, project 
uh, along with uh, it'll make the xlib file which in this case out of the box is named d underscore x dot xml and it'll create a sample pdf file called sample dot pdf okay so the next step is that you would translate it uh, so the translator would use their computer-aided translation tools but as i said for the purposes of our um, for our demonstration and for the uh, project that we're work we're using all you really need to do is um, concatenate the um, something that will distinguish uh, a pseudo translation from the original format in my example i just put the word fake 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 in front of every uh, target uh, segment and that will uh, act that will uh, be our pseudo translation okay so then you um, you change directories to the uh, data from xlif uh, version 2 uh, and you will uh, put your translated file in there and make sure that you rename the file uh, d underscore x underscore translated dot xml again this is to take advantage of the the build file that comes out of the box that's why these uh, naming conventions are important uh, so then you type uh, ant minus f build underscore data from xlif dot xml and uh, you will get the affirmative message if everything goes well uh, if you then look into the translated root directory you'll see that there's uh, uh, your your map and all of your uh, translated files and if you transform those into uh, whatever format or even look at them in a um, XML enabled tool you'll see that indeed our uh, our pseudo translations came through okay so now I'm going to uh, discuss uh, uh, translation memory and TMX and um, in order to demonstrate this, I'm going to show another tool that I created. This is a little bit more elaborate than the Data Open Toolkit. This is called XMarker. Uh, so this is a file. It's a, a computer-aided translation uh, program uh, that's available commercially. Uh, and it does all of these things uh, with uh, XLIF files. This is a tool that a translator would actually use to translate uh, XLIF files. So if you think about the workflow, where we are in the workflow now is that we've already um, transformed our data into an XLIF file, and then we can do all of these other things to it. In this, uh, for purposes of this demonstration, I'm only going to show, uh, as we said before, translation memory and term base or glossary. So uh, translation memory uh, is the um, uh, Translation memory is the technology that enables the uh, translation of segments, uh, which can be sentences, paragraphs, text strings, or phrases uh, of a document uh, by, by searching for similar segments in a collection and then suggesting that, uh, the matches that are found. So the idea is that over time, if we are doing uh, a lot of translations of a lot of documents, we remember what those translations were, right? So we remember um, uh, the, th uh, the phrase, uh, hello, Brian, uh, is uh, translated into um, hola, Brian. And we want to retain that, right? So we, in our translation memory, uh, going forward, if we ever have another uh, opportunity to translate the string, hello, Brian, uh, we, would, uh, find, we would search for the English version of that and then uh, we would be told that the Spanish uh, translation for that is uh, hola, Brian. Okay, so um, yeah, that's the definition that uh, comes from uh, this uh, web page here. So you can look that up. Uh, translation memory remembers the translations that have been typed by a human translator. When the translator needs to work on similar text, uh, the system offers a previously saved version this can save a lot of time when a translator works with repetitive text such as technical manuals uh, and it can also help to achieve terminal terminological consistency um, and it looks like I have a little typo there that I need to fix so I will do that uh, so uh, the way this workflow works is that we'll just say we start with a regular old um, uh, data project. In this case, I've got uh, a data concept that has a couple of strings uh, related to uh, punk and grunge. Um, the first string is Nirvana was an American grunge band from Aberdeen in the state of Washington. Uh, the Clash uh, founded in London in 1976 
is considered one of the most influential early punk bands alongside other bands such as the Ramones and the Sex Pistols. And then uh, Soundgarden is an American grunge band from Seattle. Okay, so that's our, our starting point. We've got that data. Uh, we transform it into uh, XLIF and we open it in this tool. So here's our, our XLIF file. So I'll demonstrate that. I'm going to uh, open uh, the XLIF file that we've converted from data to XLIF. Uh, it's in my directory here. This actually comes as a sample that comes with the software. Okay, so now I have this uh, XLIF file. Uh, similar to the one that we have on our screen there. So then the next step, uh, and you don't have to use this tool that I'm using. I'm just saying that this is a way to do it. This tool would do it. Uh, many other translation tools would do the same. So then we have to uh, find our TMX file, which is our uh, XML version of our translation memory. So I'm going to um, change to my translation memory tab. I'm going to open that file, I'm, and I know that this software comes with uh, pre-canned uh, translation memory. So here's my TMX. I'll open that, and it pops up this window, which is our translation memory file. Uh, translation memory files can be huge. They can be small. In this one, we have a couple of, uh, uh, in this TMX file, we have a couple of uh, translation memory. It looks like we've already uh, translated this in the past and we've stored the German translation here and we've translated this English string in the past and we've stored the uh, German translation here. Let me zoom in a little bit here. Okay. And then we've uh, translated the Soundgarden um, uh, segment here and the German version of that is here. So if I like that I'm going to say okay set that as my translation memory. So I've set that and the tool now has uh, a translation memory tab uh, filled out with the translation memory and we have our XLIF tab. I'll zoom in a little bit so we can see that a little bit better. Uh, that has the sentences that uh, we want to translate. Okay, so we uh, with XLIF 2.0 we have uh, several modules. Hopefully you read the specification uh, that was assigned as part of today's reading and you read about one module called Translation Candidates. So what Translation Candidates does is it um, it looks at the translation memory and it finds English terms that match the uh, XLIF source terms and it, I'll zoom in a little bit here, and it provides us with um, uh, translation candidates. So it said, I found this string, which is uh, the one about Nirvana, in your translation memory, and I recommend that this match is one that could be used. And it's up to the human translator to say, yes, I agree. Similarly, it found the one about the Clash, and it found the one about Soundgarden, and it put it in this uh, um, uh, match module. It's still, it's not in the XLIF file, it's just like these are candidates for the translation. Okay, so I'm going to move this to source. Okay, and what it did then is it uh, moved the uh, XLIF file with uh, the enriched uh, uh, translation candidates in here. So I still, as the human translator, I still have to say yay or nay to that. So going back to the slides, um, here's the uh, TMX file that we just loaded up. And uh, here's the uh, process to show the translation candidates, uh, which then, uh, as I said, put the matches uh, in the actual XLIF file. Didn't do the translation yet, just put the translation candidates in. Okay, from there, it's up to us as human translators to use our computer-aided translation tool and decide whether we want to accept those translation memory matches or not. So in this case, I'm going to hit my translate button. And it said uh, that there is a match. Do I want to view it? So I'll say yes. Let's view the match. And it says that uh, this is the match. And I say okay. I'm going to put that on my clipboard. And it tells me that it uh, put that on the clipboard. I'll say okay. And then uh, if I want to commit to that match, I'll say paste match. And it puts our German. Let me zoom in here. It puts our German. Uh, alongside our, zoom in here on the source, 
So that you see that we have this uh, German, which is now going to become our target for our XLIF. And I'll go to my next segment, and it says that it found another match. In this case, I'm going to zoom in uh, for the um, uh, the clash uh, segment. I'll view the match, and it says this is the this is the match, and I'll say yes, I I like that. Put it on my clipboard. Tells me that it put that on the clipboard, and I'm going to paste it in and so on and so forth. So I could keep going through this. Eventually I'll just say done and it uh, will then replace uh, the uh, or it'll, it'll add target strings and it will put the target language in and this is how we do our translation. So uh, just to be very clear here, what we've done is we've uh, we have an XLIF file. It has a bunch of strings uh, some of which have been translated before, uh, and those have been stored in our TMX file. We attached our TMX file uh, to our um, to our uh, uh, tool here, and then we we told it we told our tool to find all the translation candidates. It put them in matches, and then we actually did the translation, and we then uh, decided that we yes we do like the um, the uh, 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 translations that were prescribed by the translation memory. Okay, so I'm going to quit this and uh, move on to the next uh, uh, part of the demonstration here. Uh, I have to do something here. I have to refresh those files um, so we can start over and show the uh, the terms. That's just a little technical. Uh, glitch here. So going back to our demonstration, uh, the XLIF file is translated and we see that we do have uh, in place the actual strings that we wanted to, to see from our translation memory after we uh, accepted them. We convert the XLIF back to DITA and now uh, we have German um, DITA topics. Uh, so that was TMX and XLIF. Now there's another thing called TBX, which is term-based uh, exchange, and this has to do with the glossaries. So this is a little bit different. Translation memories are whole segments. Uh, terms might be just terms, you know, company names, uh, special terms that you need to have a certain way. The example that I always remember is that when I worked for General Motors, uh, we dealt in um, engine blocks. There's another term for them. Uh, some people call them crankcases. But in order to keep our um, documentation consistent, we insisted that uh, they be referred to as engine blocks. So in your terms, you could say that um, you know uh, uh, engine block is the required term, and the required translation uh, is such and such for whatever language. A little bit different than whole uh, translation memory. So the way that works is that XLIF enables the tagging of terms uh, in this little MRK element. In other words, we're, we are going to translate this whole segment, but we have to know that this particular term has a specific meaning and a specific way that we require it to be translated, regardless of what context. Uh, in this case, it's in a sentence. It could be in any sentence, uh, and that can be our corporate rule. Okay, so again, I'm going to... Um, open up my X marker tool uh, to do this work. Uh, bear with me for just one second here. Okay. It's uh, firing up off screen. I have two screens here and I'm dragging things in. Okay, so the way that works is that I again open my XLIF file that happens to have some of these terms in them. I will uh, open that same file, and in this case, the one I want to show is um, there's a uh, here. I'll zoom in so we can see that a little bit better. Uh, there's a particular place in this document where we've identified a term. Uh, a couple of them. In this case, let's pay attention to. Um, Oh, here I am. This term here, concert, 
it's marked as a term. Okay, so we know that uh, concert could have a couple of different meanings. So we'll open up our term base file. Let's keep up with the uh, slides. We'll select a TBX file. So I'm going to do that here. I'm going to go to my terms direct uh, tab, and I'm going to select. Um, I know that out of the box I have some terms that came with the software. I'll open that fire file, and uh, we'll zoom in a little bit here. And the way that this works is that we have a, a term, a TBX file. Uh, in this case, it has uh, a term entries. So uh, I see that, for example, I have this one where the term is concert. I see that it has uh, a definition. A concert is a live performance, typically of music, uh, before an audience. So that's um, maybe to distinguish it from being used as a, you know, um, kind of an and phrase. Uh, this uh, tool is to be used in concert with uh, uh, this other tool to for best results. That's the you know this is that's not the context. This is the context according to this definition. So that helps the translator. And then it also has this uh, uh, translation that we may or may not want to use. So I'll go ahead and I'll set that as our glossary. So now we have a TBX file. So now if I hit my glossary, I better stay along with the presentation. Um, there's the TBX file with the uh, uh, term identified that we're interested in, and more importantly, the definition. So then if I process that, uh, I hit my glossary button, and it says, uh, here are uh, the matches, uh, here are the, the glossary terms that we found in your TBX file. And again, it, it here, I'll zoom in here. Uh, it um, uh, gives us just the uh, hints for the for the translator, uh, clash uh, had a certain context, and uh, we found also um, a concert in our TBX file. Again, it just put in the XLIF module, uh, the glossary module. Hopefully, you read about that in the assigned reading. Uh, it put that in there as a helper for the translator. So I'll move that to the source, and now our XLIF file. Oops, XLIF file uh, has these uh, glossary uh, terms. So then, if I'm a translator and I want to know what context this word "concert" was used in, I can go up and I can look at my uh, my glossary uh, term base. I can see there's the term, uh, there's the German uh, translation, but here's the context or the definition. Okay. So that's how that works. Um, that was TBX. Uh, so uh, this uh, concludes the uh, slides for today's uh, um, uh, lesson on data translation. Hopefully this was useful to you. As usual, you can contact me with any um, questions that you have uh, regarding uh, any of the material we went over uh, today. Okay, so thank you very much, everybody. Uh, hope that helps.